Okay, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the Islamic Society of Kingston's uh, program with the RCMP on a very, very important topic today. And the topic is trafficking uh, in persons. And sometimes we think, you know, human trafficking looks a certain way. And uh, usually uh, it's actually surprising to find that human trafficking has many different forms. And we'll be discussing that, uh, or I should say rather, uh, a good friend of mine from the RCMP, uh, Constable Nathan Morano, will be speaking to us about uh, human trafficking. And uh, he works with the Kingston RCMP uh, on border integrity, in the border integrity uh, unit. Um, He's a good friend of mine, and we have many different uh, conversations, and he's no stranger to the community as well. We've uh, had many different uh, interactions at the mosque, uh, the masjid, as well as online. Uh, so this will be another presentation uh, by Constable uh, Nathan Moreno. So thank you, uh, Constable, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it's all yours. Thanks so much. As always, thanks for having me. Uh... I had really hoped that we could have been in person again this time, but uh, I mean, logistics of the world in play means uh, we have to make sacrifices. Um, I really appreciate though you having me again uh, today, especially on this topic. It's a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, as some of you probably already know me and know my history, uh, I'll try to speed along through that a little bit, but I'll give you a bit of an understanding of why it's so near and dear to me. Um, <clears throat> I started my career in, uh, in Southern Manitoba in a town called Bozager, uh, in 2009. Uh, one of probably within the first month or two of my service, we were called to a situation with a youth female. Um, she was in foster care, but she was having a violent outburst and, uh, the social workers from the province who were working with her couldn't handle that. Um, so we arrived and I met this girl for the first time. She was 11 years old. Uh, however, I think she had probably lived enough lives to be probably in her thirties. Um, she, uh, she had been trafficked from Northern Manitoba by gangs uh, into Southern Manitoba and into Winnipeg where she was prostituted out. Um, she, uh, after getting to talk to her a little bit, it became very evident that like everybody else, she was just a kid. Um, but she had been put into this world, uh, not by her choosing and had really adapted to it, which was absolutely terrifying to me. Um, being somebody junior in service, I didn't really realize what kind of resources were available at the time. Um, the laws on human trafficking had just recently kind of changed as well at that point in time. Um, so we took her out of Bozier into Winnipeg, had probably about four or five hours to kill, uh, in order to get her into uh, a respite, uh, area. So we stopped and got some lunch and talked and, uh, she had kind of run through some of her experiences with, uh, with the gang and that gang had kind of become her family. And for the life of me at the time, I couldn't understand how that could be. Um, and so we parted ways and, uh, I never, I never saw her again. Now she could be in Winnipeg still. I hope only good things for, her, and I hope that she got the help that she needed to get out of that kind of lifestyle. However, it was one of those instances that really stuck, stuck with me and, uh, human trafficking and understanding human trafficking has been something that I've, I've tried to do now. So. Um, I have a presentation for you all today. Uh, some of the content may be a little bit dry. Some of it may be a little bit emotional as well. And uh, when I do presentations on this topic, I like to let, uh, give everybody a bit of a heads up. Uh, some of the content can be alarming. Uh, some of it can be surprising. Uh, so just keep that in mind and nobody would think any less of you if you have to mute, uh, mute me or, uh, or turn it off. Uh, I certainly wouldn't hold any grudges for that, not on a topic like this. Uh, 
like I enjoy doing at the end, I, I will try to answer questions as best as I can if, uh, if there are any. If, if I don't have an answer for it, I'll do my very best to try to get an answer for you. Um, and we'll relay that through the EMOM. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get right into it. This is like, can at times be a little bit uh, technically incompetent here, but I'm going to do my best. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> trafficking in persons. Uh, this presentation was put together by our National uh, Human Trafficking Unit, which is housed out of Ottawa. However, it's uh, while the, the the unit may be out of Ottawa, they deal with uh, incidents all over the country and even internationally. Um, they're, they're a wealth of knowledge on the subject as well. So what is human trafficking? A lot of people tend to think, uh, when they think of human trafficking, they think of uh, something that in the 90s were called container people, uh, which would be people who are found in shipping containers being sent from one country to another uh, for employment or uh, to avoid having to go through uh, normal border checks. Human trafficking is not that, not always anyway. Human trafficking involves uh, the recruitment of uh, and transportation or harboring or exercising direction or influence over the movements of persons in order to exploit, typically for sexual uh, exploitation or forced labor. Now, there are other types of human trafficking. Um, we'll get into a little bit of it, but those types aren't very prevalent within Canada. So there's, here's uh, one of the differences, there's domestic and then international human trafficking. So one of the big takeaways here is the difference between human trafficking and what I had referred to before as the container people, um, which isn't what it's called now, um, is the element of consent. So human trafficking, there is zero consent. No, these people are taken and forced into these situations. Uh, human smuggling uh, has an element of consent to it, at least within Canadian law. So that would be somebody who decides that they want to come into Canada uh, or another country for that. However, uh, they aren't able or willing to go through the normal processes to get into Canada. So they might hire someone. I, if you watched any, uh, uh, any shows on it, I know... Uh, they'll talk about coyotes through the Mexican border into the U.S. And that, that would be somebody who just facilitates travel. Um, now, human smuggling is, uh, is a very different topic. Uh, smuggling can sometimes become trafficking, but trafficking can, can never become smuggling and that because of that element of consent. So in the domestic field, the uh, domestic human trafficking situations, uh, don't involve an international border. International travel or trafficking do involve that international border. So here are some uh, some Canadian stats. Uh, these are relevant as of July six uh, July twenty sixteen. Now, I've heard some uh, some pretty discouraging numbers. Uh, coming out of uh, this COVID era, uh, where numbers have really increased, particularly when it comes to internet-based trafficking, uh, which involves, well, we'll get into it in a little bit here, but so for this slide, um, as you can see, the majority of cases are domestic uh, and 95% are involved uh, in sexual exploitation of young female Canadians. 70% uh, of those victims are under the age of 25. 81% uh, of the fender, offenders were uh, identified as males. Now, that, that stat, while on the surface, doesn't seem all that surprising. Um, when you think about the remainder of that percentage, that would mean that the rest are females who are, who are the offenders. Um, I know a lot of people tend to be kind of shocked at the idea of uh, 
a female being involved and even being the one in charge of uh, these uh, offender groups, but it, it is possible and it, it does happen. Some of the female offenders are even under the age of 18. So this is human smuggling. Uh, this is, these are actual photos of people being smuggled into, uh, into countries. I, I believe these ones are into the US. Um, there are tons of different ways that it happens. Uh, often when people are smuggled into Canada for profit, they are, um, they're exploited financially, uh, often having to give incredibly large sums of money to, uh, to a smuggler to facilitate the transport into the country. Often what ends up happening as well is the people who are smuggled into the country are then, uh, then subject to an even larger criminal organization who will hold on to their passports, hold on to any kind of ID, sometimes take whatever money or possessions that they may have. And then they say, well, now you guys have to work for us because I realize that you spent 20, 30, 40, $50,000 to come into the country. Um, however, the price went up and I have your passport. So your option is to live with us or to work for me um, in whatever field I determine you will work in or we'll either send you back, uh, kill you, uh, or if you have a family member who was supposed to be on another group coming in, uh, that person won't make it into Canada. Organ trafficking is something that we don't see very often in uh, inside the borders of Canada. Now, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen abroad. Um, the number one uh, type of organ trafficking uh, that Canadians participate in, and Americans for that, or Western Europeans, would be uh, transplant tourism. Uh, so transplant tourism would be if you need a liver or a kidney or a heart uh, or lungs or, or anything, um, and you can't get onto a list inside of Canada or the US or the list is too long, you travel to a country where uh, the sale of organs isn't necessarily illegal. So you'll travel to that country, you'll find somebody, a facilitator, a trafficker, and that person will set up everything for you. They'll book you hotels, they'll book you into a hospital, uh, they'll book you in for a doctor, and they'll find the organ that you need. So as this slide said, organ trafficking uh, is the transplant sorry, transplantation of healthy organs into persons who own, who their organs have failed. Organs may be forcibly removed to sell on the black market or the donors may be deceived on the procedure compensation and recovery. So sometimes uh, where the deception is involved, they'll say, okay, we have somebody who needs a kidney. Uh, it's this type of blood type. We understand that you have that blood type. Um, will buy your kidney for $50,000, $60,000. However, they will then charge these people a recovery fee. So they will go in, have an organ removed, and then to be stitched back up, to have the use of anesthetic, um, that will all cost. So that $60,000 that they were supposed to be giving them now may go down to 10,000, may even go down to less. Sometimes they just won't bother uh, even fixing the wound. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a particularly heinous type of crime that to, to remove an organ from somebody uh, who may be looking at this as a legitimate way of getting ahead. They're, they're willing to provide an organ for somebody else believing that they're going to be getting enough money or resources to uh, to further their lives or the life of their family. Uh, forced labor is uh, is something that is common in Canada. Uh, 
it does happen from time to time. I know there's been several piles uh, up around the Toronto area and down through Niagara for uh, fruit picking uh, construction. Uh, it's a lot of, they're always, well, almost always very labor intensive jobs uh, that in order to find people to do the work, it's gonna cost you money. So labor traffickers will bring people in. Often I find that people who are forced into labor trafficking were people who were also smuggled into the country. Um, they find themselves in Canada, they find themselves being charged fees to live at these labor camps. Um, and a labor camp, it's probably not what you think it might be. A labor camp could be any house any commercial property, any, any residential property where there might be 15, 20 people living in a house that's made for five people. Um, the hot bunk, which uh, some of you may have heard that term before, where they're going to be using the same beds for the same sleeping areas and they're on different shifts. So let's say 12 people leave for work in the morning, they do a 12 hour shift, they come home and the people who are sleeping are now going to work for the rest of that 12 hours of the 24 hour day. Um, it, uh, one of the, the big signs of things like this is these people won't be allowed to, to go anywhere alone. They're not allowed to go to Walmart to go shopping. Um, they buy their supplies from the trafficker a lot of the times. Um, this is uh, essentially indentured servitude or uh, modern day slavery. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just going to talk a little bit more on this. Uh, on the second bullet here, it says it may include working without pay, performing tasks outside of the scope of the employment contract, not receiving vacation or overtime pay, working extremely long hours, deductions of fee for food or accommodations from paychecks and particularly for women, uh, sexual violence. Um, so there's a thin line between uh, sexual exploitation uh, for the purpose, or well, trafficking for sexual exploitation purposes um, and forced labor. Uh, often the, uh, the lines are blurred. Um, women who are forced into cleaning, uh, are often forced into um, sexual acts by employers as well. Um, sometimes the, uh, the job of cleaning, uh, cleaning or food preparation will then turn into um, stripping or other types of exotic uh, dancing and even, uh, even the use of the internet for web broadcasts and uh, other sorts of videos. So in Canada, there are, there are several avenues that police and law enforcement can use um, when dealing with perpetrators of human trafficking. So the criminal code makes it illegal. The Immigration and Refugee Protection Act make it illegal. Um, that's why you aren't allowed to do it in Canada. Um, that said, just because it's illegal doesn't mean people don't do it. Um, So here are some of the elements that are needed when, uh, when police enter into an investigation surrounding human trafficking. Uh, so the act would be the recruitment, uh, the transportation, transfer, harboring, uh, receipts uh, of persons, plus the means. So that's the threat or use of force, coercion, abduction, fraud, deception, abuse of power, vulnerability, uh, giving payments or benefit. Plus, and here's the purpose. Now, why are they doing it? It's going to be for exploitation, which includes forced commercial uh, sex work or other sexual exploitation, um, forced labor, slavery or similar practices, uh, organ trafficking, etc. So, if we can if we can isolate isolate an act means and the purpose by which it's uh, occurring or for which it's occurring um, then we come down to human trafficking so 
This is just kind of a mind map that investigators uh, use to ensure that all the elements are there uh, to charge somebody with the offense. So these are some general indicators. Now these change year to year, they can change location to location or country to country. Um, but these are just some, some that are, are fairly common. Um, branding or tattooing, uh, scarring, or uh, which indicates ownership. So if you have a trafficking, a trafficker or a group that let's say has a symbol like a dollar sign that indicates uh, the name of that organization. So that dollar sign might be tattooed on like this area of somebody uh, or on their chest or their arm. Uh, branding uh, can also include uh, legitimately being branded, so burned with that image. Now I have uh, recently uh, taken some training where it would appear that some traffickers are starting to uh, starting to use technology a little bit more freely. So rather than having a brand like that, they'll have a QR code tattooed onto somebody or they'll actually have a, a small tracking device uh, put into somebody. Um, I've heard of uh, some instances in the United States where uh, the implants for animals who are lost, they'll have one of those put in so they can scan the girl or the boy um, and it will, it will tell you who they belong to, uh, being escorted or watched everywhere they go. I think that one kind of speaks for itself, uh, moving locations frequently, not speaking for themselves. Um, that one can be a little bit more subtle, uh, not speaking for themselves. Uh, however, it is something that is incredibly common in this, uh, in this uh, this type of offense. So, for example, uh, a group show up at a hotel. Uh, the hotel is along a, uh, a very common route, so like Highway 401. Um, they walk into the hotel. Let's say there's three or four people, two guys, uh, two girls or three girls, or three boys. Um, there will be one person who is in charge. Now, one other, the other person, the subservient person may be made to pay for the room and use their identification for the room. Uh, however, all the talking is done by um, somebody in charge. Now, that is a term that has been called many things. Uh, probably the one that most people are common with is a pimp. Um, no passport, ID, or other form of identification. Also very common, uh, they won't be allowed to carry their ID. Um, if there's a purse, somebody else might actually be carrying a purse for them, uh, which contains all their identification. Uh, it'll contain money. Uh, and uh, the passport part is usually if people have first been smuggled into the country uh, or brought to Canada under false pretense, which is another thing that's very common. They'll say uh, there are jobs for babysitting or nannying um, or jobs working uh, working as a model. And when they come over, it turns out that those jobs don't exist. Uh, however, the people have been legally brought to Canada under the pretense that they were going to be a nanny or a model. Um, limited knowledge about how to get around in a community. Now that is usually because they're moved. So one of the one of the elements of trafficking would be the movement of people, right? So if somebody is recruited in uh, in Montreal and then brought to Kingston, now they're probably not going to know their way around the community. Uh, live on or near uh, the work premises. So if they're working at a massage parlor. Uh, maybe the trafficker owns some property adjacent to it. Um, often, and unfortunately, uh, and the only reason I use this term is because it is used by survivors of trafficking, they will call that a stable, uh, where a trafficker will hold uh, or house the people that they exploit. Um, lack of private space, personal belongings, or financial records. So one thing that we have seen happening recently um, is a trafficker will 
will have an individual go to a bank and start a line of credit for themselves. Trafficker will then pull all the money out of that line of credit and leave that debt on the trafficky. So it's another way for a trafficker to make money um, and another way to exploit uh, the trafficked persons. So signs of malnourishment and fatigue, uh, they don't get breaks. They don't, often they will have to buy the food from the trafficker as well. So the trafficker will keep, uh, will keep a, a receipt essentially, or a checklist on everything that they've provided to them. So we went out and bought you soap. We went out and bought you shampoo. We went out and got you noodles or McDonald's and, uh, they will expect to be reimbursed for that. Um, signs of impairment by drugs, another, another element that uh, is used by a trafficker to control the traffic. -y. Um, I mean, if you, if you've sat in on any of the lecture, uh, hesitate to say lectures, I'm not, I'm not a professor, but, um, any of the talks that I've given on, uh, on the use of drugs, uh, you, you'll understand why drugs are so useful in manipulating and controlling people. Uh, indicators of control and abuse, fear, isolation, dependency, debt bondage. Debt bondage uh, is something that I had just spoken about. The idea that the trafficker will go out and provide, and I use that word very loosely, to provide um, food or lodging, but it's at a it's at a price, and often it's at an extremely high price, something completely ridiculous and unfounded. Um, shame and guilt uh, or religious beliefs. Um, traffickers are not beyond abusing religion uh, in order to try to force people into, uh, into these arrangements. Um, so potential victims of forced labor. This is moving on from, uh, from just the uh, sexual uh, trafficking. Uh, people who are forced to work through violence or intimidation often uh, for no or little pay. Um, victims are treated as property. Now that is something that is common throughout all forms of trafficking. Um, I think if you were to delve into the psyche of the trafficker, uh, you would find that they really view people as property and only as things that can benefit themselves. Um, usually exploit it uh, to create a product for profit. Uh, many are trapped in a foreign country, uh, may not speak your local language, uh, travel documents or identification are confiscated and held by the trafficker. So this is where trafficking and smuggling uh, often collide. You will have people brought to Canada uh, under a, brought to Canada, under a false pretense. Um, they'll be told that they're coming to Canada to do construction. Uh, they're coming to Canada to build a roadway or work in a farm. And as soon as they come to Canada, uh, everything is confiscated from them. And it turns out that they're not working on a farm. Uh, they're gonna be working, digging ditches somewhere, uh, or they're gonna be forced um, forced to get a license and, uh, and work as a transport driver or as a, a transport driver hand. Um, there, there's any type of labor can be, uh, can be forced. Um, so pimps or traffickers, uh, that's one of the common lingo, uh, for a traffickers to be called a pimp, uh, they'll ad identify, uh, vulnerabilities of victims, uh, the need for financial support, uh, gain a desire for love or affection, which uh, are two main vulnerabilities that make individuals uh, most susceptible to trafficking. Um, a lot of people don't believe that this happens in our community, but it does. Um, people can be recruited at all ages. Uh, I've I've dealt with people who are recruited uh, directly from high schools, um, from high school parties. 
uh, usually they're recruited by something that is called a Romeo pimp. Now a Romeo pimp uh, is somebody who will use love and affection uh, as a form of uh, as a form of exploitation and uh, a way to uh, try to brainwash you. Uh, often people who are who fall victim to this will will have to deal with something very similar to Stockholm syndrome where they identify with uh, with the person. They will actually believe that they love the pimp um, and that they're there to to help them. Uh, there's been situations where uh, high schoolers will go to a party. There might be somebody they don't notice there, very charismatic person, very generous person, uh, usually offering uh, offering food or drinks or drugs um, to everybody. Now that person is usually a very accomplished um, in body language uh, or understanding body language. So they will seek out people who appear to have low self-esteem, uh, kind of the wallflower type people at the party um, or somebody who has something to prove. So they will they'll tend to seek them out um, and then manipulate them uh, into becoming friends and to maybe becoming partners. Uh, usually this type of uh, this type of exploitation may take a little bit of time because that that Romeo pimp wants to get to know the person a little bit, understand some of the dynamics in their life, see where they're most most vulnerable uh, or susceptible to being exploited. Um, and that, that Romeo pimp, he or she will, will take the time and they will get to know you and they will give you that attention for the person, uh, the attention that they want. Um, while they're doing that though, they're going to be isolating them from their friends and their family, uh, whatever social group they may have. Um, they might introduce new things like drugs or alcohol, um, shopping is another big one that uh, they'll go after younger people with. That. So if you have a friend who is showing up at school and, you know, a week or two ago, they were saying, oh, I really want an iWatch or, uh, or a new phone. And they have this new phone and they're not really willing to say where they got it from. Uh, that's kind of one of the indicators as well. It's, uh, it's something that in the profession is called love bombing, where you give all this love and all this affection to somebody um, in order to manipulate. Uh, however, the pimp always keeps track. So at a certain point in time, they'll usually come and say something along, along the lines of, you know, I really need help with, uh, with this. I'm going to lose my car. I'm going to lose my apartment. Or, you know, I got involved with this group of people and they're going to hurt me and I need you to do this for me. And that's where uh, they'll introduce a sex act. <clears throat> usually something, uh, something, um, not uh, not too invasive, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, at the time. And uh, it will only get worse from there. Um, indigenous victims of human trafficking, uh, of course, like everybody else, uh, Indigenous people are at risk of this uh, also um, due to uh, a huge amount of, of factors. Uh, indigenous girls and boys uh, are often targeted and uh, do become victim to this, uh, um, uh, this sort of thing. Uh, indigenous girls in foster care have become targets of sexual predators who use uh, the foster care system for easy access. Um, uh, they're well, I'll, uh, I'll allow you to read this part out yourself. Uh, however, it is, uh, it is another plight of uh, the Indigenous people of Canada. So the state of mind of the victim, they may not self-identify as a victim of being trafficked at all. Uh, trauma bonding, uh, is like I had had, uh, like I had said before, is that Stockholm like uh, situation where uh, they have gone through so much, but they don't 
they now believe that the trafficker is somebody that they've shared this trauma with. And it, it does, it imparts uh, a part of yourself to them, which is one of the reasons why dealing with victims of trafficking can be so difficult. Um, trying to provide assistance to them can be incredibly difficult. Um, in speaking with, with survivors, they often say that um, the recidivism rate is, is, is fairly high. Uh, they might be low and yearning for some sort of affection. And the first person that pops into mind is the trafficker. Uh, isolated from home, country, province, territory, often people are moved around because being isolated uh, in almost anything makes people uh, more, uh, more able to be manipulated. Um, they don't have that social group. They don't have that sober second thought that a brother or a sister or a friend or a family member or, um, or somebody may be able to give to them. Uh, affiliation with the tra uh, traffickers develop uh, surviving skills. So they, they begin to understand what they need to do to stay in favor of these traffickers. And uh, by being in favor of the traffickers, that might mean that they get fed. Uh, or they don't have to sleep in a car and they get to sleep in a hotel room. Uh, they get to bathe, uh, very fundamental things. Um, sometimes this will involve uh, using uh, victims to recruit new victims as well, for survivors to recruit new victims. Um, feel responsible or feels better about current situation than the alternative. So they feel responsible for putting themselves in that position. And that is something that is, uh, that's exploited uh, or that traffickers will exploit as well, that self guilt. Um, I can't believe that I allowed myself to be in this spot. Um, you know, this is, it's really, it's my fault for being so stupid not to see uh, what they were trying to do to me. Something like that. Uh, and then, uh, feeling better about the current situation than the alternatives. Um, even in torment, people can become uh, familiar with it. And the fear of something new that could, in their mind, potentially be worse, uh, kind of keeps them in place. Uh, unable to break invisible bonds, so they don't have shelter, they don't have food, they don't have security. They have no money. Uh, there's essentially they're going to be leaving their entire social network. So if they are part of, as I said earlier, what they call a stable. So there's four or five people in this stable. They become uh, they become attached to them as other victims. And if they're leaving now, they're leaving their friends, uh, which is a, a very hard thing to do. Uh, what's the trafficker's perspective? Victims are a source of income, merchandise, other products that you can buy, sell, or trade. So a trafficker, a trafficker will view a person as they would view a car or a table or, or any, any sort of property, something that they can rent out for a period of time and, uh, and make money off of. Traffickers are also, as I had said before, they're very, very accomplished manipulators. Um, I've, I've spoken with traffickers in the past and uh, their callousness and the way they view people is, uh, is pretty awful. Um, it's very transactional. Uh, they, they really do view things from a dollar and cents or a business perspective. So the RCMP works with uh, law enforcement agencies to share information and collaborate on investigations that are cross-jurisdictional. So that means um, if you have people who are traveling from Ontario to Alberta, for, uh, for instance, who are transporting uh, people uh, to be used uh, for labor or sex practices or, or anything, uh, the RCMP can help facilitate uh, can help facilitate the investigation, provide assistance and support. Um, another 
another thing that we're doing, like uh, like I'm doing right now, uh, in order to combat trafficking, uh, we're we're pretty heavy on public education at the moment. Um, I've done several uh, discussions like this, and I'm actually I'm part of a uh, a local uh, working group on human trafficking uh, that attempts to try to help. Uh, organize resources for for people who are who fall victim to it. Um, as I had mentioned as well, uh, trying to assist uh, survivors can be very difficult as the trauma bonding that goes along with it. Uh, I mean, you can equate it to some of the worst post traumatic stress situations that you can imagine. Uh, fear of everything. Um, anxiety. Uh, uh, misunderstanding, self-harm, uh, they're all very, very common with survivors of, uh, of trafficking. And it's something that we need to work with uh, as a society to provide, uh, provide assistance to them. Uh, uh, like any other uh, situation, if they're not willing to take the help, um, there's not a whole lot we can do. However, one of the problems is they don't often understand that they need the help. Um, so it can be a pretty labor intensive situation, but uh, the RCMP along with other police forces and social service networks are, and a lot of non, uh, a lot of NGOs um, are, are putting a lot forward to try to uh, assist the victims of this. So, this is the Canadian Human Trafficking Hotline. Uh, if at any point in time you suspect somebody or you need information on it, or you yourself find yourself uh, to be a victim of it, you can call this, uh, this number and uh, they can help talk you through what needs to happen. Um, one out of the life, you can call the, the hotline. Uh, Crime Stoppers is another another one. Uh, you can call your local police department or talk to somebody you trust. So our national human trafficking section, this is just a little bit of a biography on what, uh, what they're focused on at the moment is to provide education and outreach and awareness to law enforcement government partners and the general public uh, focus on updating training, uh, which is something that has in the past lacked. Uh, we, uh, we're starting to, to understand the psychology behind trafficking a little bit better. Uh, we still have a long way to go um, and there's always room for improvement on it. But uh, I can tell you right now that uh, we are better at this now than we were 10 years ago. Um, we're, we're better at identifying it. We're better at helping. Um, we're better at providing support. Um, and I hope that uh, with, with the help of the community and uh, the help of other professions, uh, we're able to, to get to a point where uh, people who are finding themselves victim of this are more willing uh, to see us as allies, as opposed to uh, somebody who's just going to pick them up and put them in jail. Uh, supporting operations nationwide, advance in the modernization of policy, and that's essentially what I was talking about there. Uh, developing partnerships, uh, coordinating, participating uh, uh, to anti-human trafficking laws, enforcement, and uh, government initiatives. So this is our national human trafficking uh, uh, email address. Uh, feel free to write it down. If you have questions, you can you can send it their way. Um, they are the experts on it. Uh, I uh, I take this portfolio for the Kingston detachment. Uh, like I said, as it's something that's kind of near and dear to me, and something that I feel uh, is incredibly important. Um, that is it for the PowerPoint. Try to get out of here. Stop sharing my screen. And unfortunately, you'll be able to see me again. Um, I have some time. So if there are any questions, please feel free. That's all. I'll leave it up to you.
Perfect. Thank you for that uh, amazing and, and very, very informative uh, presentation. Um, there's so many things that are there uh, to learn from. And again, a lot of misconceptions, right? You, you, you always think, okay, they're going to be in just some metal box and, you know, shipping containers and, and that's all it is. Uh, but there's a lot of signs that, you, you know, you kind of talked about. Um, and that's so important. One of the questions, is, you know, is there a specific like demographic or are there certain people that are usually more targeted than other people? So statistics show that uh, youth females are at a higher risk. Now, I'm not, I don't have any evidence to, to say that's wrong. However, I have spoken with uh, some male survivors and male survivors of human trafficking are out there often uh, often they face um, they face a, a bit of a different challenge mentally with coming to terms with it and asking for help for it. Um, there there are some speakers, one particular out of the U.S. Uh, who is a, who's phenomenal. He has a wealth of information on uh, on male trafficking, and I think that it may be a situation where the stats just haven't, we just don't have the information on it to update the stats to show an actual representation of how many men and boys are trafficked as well, uh, particularly particularly for uh, for sexual uses. Right. Um, now, one of the things you mentioned in, in, in the state of mind of the victim is that they may not self-identify. Yes. And that must make it like, 10 times more difficult to kind of understand or to kind of even catch uh, the perpetrators. Absolutely. I, if you don't have the assistance of the victim uh, within Canadian law, it makes it very hard. Um, it makes it very hard to even open a file sometimes if you, if you don't have a victim. Like you can look at it and as a police officer, see that something's wrong. But without having that victim, without having somebody saying, I need your help, we can't get involved. Um, that's not always the case, but that is often the case. Uh, so trying to provide the services and the education, uh, particularly to youth, um, that this is happening and everybody, everybody can be touched by it. Anybody can be touched by it. Um, I feel is, is very important. It's, uh, um, it's, it's easier than people think to fall victim to situations like this. It's the same as domestic violence. Um, often people don't view themselves as a victim of it, even though they might be living some of the worst of it. And so it, it's important to stay, uh, to stay on top of the education part of it. And as hard as it is, especially for kids, uh, and I don't like using the word kids. I, I, I don't mean it as a demeaning term by any stretch, but younger people, Right. Um, without some of the burden of the ex experience of, of dealing with people, um, it's easier to, uh, it's easier to think that everybody has your best intentions at heart. And that unfortunately isn't always the case. Right. And, uh, one more the question, um, that I was thinking about. So in some of the indicators that you mentioned, you know, there's fear, there's isolation, dependency, there's debt, uh, bondage. You know, so what is this religious beliefs like? That, how, how does that play in? Um, religious beliefs can can be a lot of things. Uh, there are situations where family members will traffic um, their sisters, their brothers, um, and in a lot of religion that. Uh, that idea that your parents are are of paramount importance and listening to them and following everything they say uh, is um, is a directive by by God. Um, now, these cases are are honestly the hardest um, because religion is built into us, right? Right. It's such a core value and such an important part that it's easily manipulated. Um, you have uh, people that will misinterpret uh, misinterpret passages from the Bible or the Quran 
um, uh, or any holy book. And uh, they'll use it to their advantage to say, no, I'm sorry, you're not allowed to do this um, because of this, that, or the next. But you will do this because I'm your father, or I'm your mother, or I'm your older brother, or I'm the authority in the home, and I am telling you to do it. Um, we, there are other groups, uh, other groups that can be classified as cults, um, who will manipulate the word, uh, in order to, to say that free love is, um, an expression of God. And that, so there, there were, there were cult groups, uh, particularly through the U S and South America. Um, I believe there were a few in Asia as well that would use that. Um, and they would, they would say that sex and uh, the duty to, to be open about it um, and use it to recruit mm -hmm. um, were directives from the divine. So uh, it, 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 it's a very complicated subject. Yeah. And uh, when, when you enter religion into anything, Right, um, and this is this is no different. I hope that answered. Yeah, that that, that does, and, it, and, I, and I really appreciate that because um, a lot of people, um, you know, kind of don't understand where the responsibility and the rights of parents end, and then you know the other person's own individual uh, life begins. And you mentioned something that you know, you know, the, the parents can will tell you certain things, uh, but then there's a limit. Uh, and and beyond that, that's it's. They would say it's God's will, or you know, this is you have you have to obey me as your as as your parent. But what what's interesting is that there's a verse uh, even in the Quran, and I'm pretty sure there's something in the Bible and the other scriptures as well that says, you know, um, you obey your parents till the point where they tell you to do something wrong, right, or something that's uh, lewd or something that's against the the entire tenets uh, and the rulings and the obligations. Uh, so the, one of the verses does state that, you know, that as long as they, the, you, you obey them, as long as they tell you to work within the framework of the religion, but if it's something outside of the framework of the religion, uh, their authority actually ends. Uh, and so they cannot use that as a tool to, to manipulate, uh, you know, that child or that person uh, to do their bidding. And so that's very interesting that you mentioned that. Thank you for that. No, thank you. Uh, let me just check if there's anything other questions here. Okay, so I don't see any more questions here uh, at this time. So um, okay. I just really want to thank you um, for joining us this Sunday afternoon. And yeah, I learned a lot, and I and and you know this was something that we were planning for a long time, and so I'm glad yeah. that uh, we're able to get this and scratch this off that list. And uh, we have other programs, right, with you as well uh, in the near future. Um, and uh, we will be, you know, uh, as a community, we'll be uh, looking forward to hearing from you again. I want to thank the viewers um, watching live, or uh, if you watch it later on um, as a recording. Um, that uh, I want to thank you for watching and joining us. And uh, Constable Nathan Moreno, I want to thank you again uh, for this beautiful and informative presentation. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the, the day. Uh, take care. Thank you so much. And uh, as always, it's an honor to, to speak to you all. And I, I truly do appreciate you inviting me in and being, being so open with me. I, uh, I really do. Thank you. Take care of yourselves. Assalamu alaikum. Goodbye.